Hello everyone, uh, my name is Ivy. I am a gRPC Java maintainer. So today, uh, my overview talk will walk you through the core concepts and a request lifecycle in gRPC. So I know many of you have already been US, uh, using gRPC, which is awesome, but whether you are a gRPC expert or just uh, recently started gRPC, this talk, I believe, will probably have something for you. And if you are just started, we have the uh, code labs throughout the day uh, in breakout rooms. Those are perfect for, to gain some practical experience on gRPC. So let's get started. By the end of the session, you'll be all set for the whole day of rich topics and advanced use cases around gRPC. First of all, gRPC is a cutting edge, open source, and high performance remote procedure call from framework. Um, it is the go-to standard in the industry. But to put it simpler uh, term, it, think of it as a super uh, fast flight service for your data. It is zipping your business bytes across the internet. gRPC use cases everywhere. It enables communication between a wide range of devices from the mobile phone to web browser to desk desktops and to various backend platforms. This versatility makes it perfect to building microservices and distributed applications, whether in on-premise, in the cloud, or in the containers. gRPC is popular because it is suitable for many needs. In addition to being available in a wide range of platforms and languages, the performance is industry leading. It is blazing fast, incredibly efficient, that connects your application and services at a very reliable and smooth way. Many components in gRPC are designed to be pluggable, like there are different transports suitable for different devices and environments. Like you can specify serialization a wire format, or you can specify interceptors, etc. This all makes integrating with your development stack very efficient and flexible. gRPC has rich features around the um, core traffic management or security and the tailored ones for, uh, for service mesh, just to name a few. Let's expand more on all of these dimensions. gRPC's popular, uh, popularity stands on a few key fundamental design decisions that brings in cutting edge technologies on top of it. One is that gRPC is using protobuf for data serialization and generating interfaces. Protobuf is an open source language agnostic framework. Uh, all of the gRPC implement uh, language implementations use protobuf plugin to generate interfaces. Therefore, these language, uh, these gRPC language can talk with each other over various devices and platforms. Protobuf uses binary encoding. It is very efficient in parsing and reduces message sizes, all of which make gRPC high performance and high flexibility compared with other RPC frameworks. gRPC boasts an extensive support of languages and platforms as evidenced from this list. Um, the exciting news, as Kevin Abishak mentioned, that Rust, gRPC Rust, is coming soon. So uh, don't miss out today's session if you want to learn more about it. Another key design decision is that gRPC is built on top of HTTP2. That makes it compatible with uh, a variety of load balancers and proxies over the wild internet. HTTP2 reduces TCP connection, is binary, and use header compression all of which makes gRPC high performance, reduce latency, and make better use of resources. Okay, core concepts. So gRPC's core concept starts with channel. Channel is an abstract of the endpoint that you can send or receive messages. It is the first object that you will create when you are using gRPC. To create a channel, you will provide the target UI string to specify the remote host name, and then channel credentials for authorization. Again, I um, highly recommend to attend those code labs to gain more practical experiences quickly. So as a channel is like a water pipe placeholder, the subchannels are the real connections towards the backend um, services. 
gRPC during its life cycle will create those subchannels, dynamically selects subchannels to multiplex RPCs over the channel, and it will report channel status, and finally tear down the subchannels to return resources. gRPC is very simple to use. The application only needs to send a request of the stub that is created from the channel. And the stub is at the protobuf generated layer, which is also the first layer that you will see when you're using gRPC. The stub creates call towards the gRPC runtime, and then further creates stream on the transport. So in gRPC, an RPC, a call, or stream are fundamentally the same concept just referred to by different names at various um, the stages in their life cycle. Because the transport speaks IP address, while you specify a target UI string when you are creating the channel, so the first thing gRPC will do is to do this uh, translation before it contacts the internet. Name resolution is often thought to be the same as DNS, but in practice, however, uh, name resolution is often augmented with extensions or completely replaced to do name resolution. Fundamentally, name resolution is uh, service discovery and it's pluggable. You can bring in the custom name resolver by specifying a schema and then you will put the schema as a syntax in the target URL string. gRPC will do this mapping for you. Name resolver returns service config to the next component, which is load balancer. Load balancer manages subchannels, create connections, and distribute requests among the backend, multiple backend services. By taking the service config, load balancer can understand where and how to route the traffic, like which kind of load balancer type to use, their configurations, whether to do health check, etc. Load balancer is a pluggable component. The built-in load balancer types are pick first, which is the default, and uh, round robin, weighted round robin, list request, etc. So for the first time the system establishes, load balancer will um, create connection towards the backend service um, that is listening on the certain ports. When the system is running, load balancer will monitor the connections on those subchannels, and if necessary, it will tear down some channels subchannels and replace with new ones. Like for example, the back end becomes unhealthy. Uh, load balancer essentially divides GRP system into control plane and data plane. It maintains a cache, cached picker that uh, dynamically selects a subchannel on the per RPC based routing. And this is on the data plane path, while on the control plane path, the load balancer will swap the cache in flight. This essentially ensures that the gRPC is scalable effectively and high performance. LB is one of the most critical components in gRPC, so if you are interested in learning more, you can check out ESWAS session today. Upon the connection establishment, gRPC will send a request over the wire. It is using the protobuf serialization and the data is framed using HTTP2 protocol. The server side is a mirror of the client side. The server transportation, once received the request, um, will pass up the messages to the GRPC runtime towards the stub and notifies the application. The application sends a response back on the stub. GRPC communicates back to the client. And depending on how many those kind of round trips in each RPC, GRP supports four types of them. Unary call is that you only have one request and response um, within single RPC, while by streaming is that you have multiple on both directions, and uh, similarly for client streaming and server streaming. In principle, GRPC is always asynchronous, um, but some of the APIs are blocking. These are just special cases of the asynchronous calls. You can choose one for your business logic. A few more bonus um, tips for the core concepts in the gRPC lifecycle. So at the channel and the server layer, interceptors are useful tools to add a task, tasks that are independent of the methods but apply to all or most of the RPCs. Interceptors are very powerful middleware tools to add tasks to um, modify or replace 
your, your, your calls um, before and after they reach their destination at both the client and the server side. This provides a very clean way to um, address uh, cutting edge concerns like logging, authentication, authorization, like error handling, monitoring, et cetera, without cluttering your main application logic. You can provide multiple um, client and server interceptors and their order matters. For example, if you are installing two client interceptors, the caching and logging interceptor, and if you put log, uh, caching interceptor front, then that means you are focusing more on the communication because the logging part will be just skipped if you have a, a cache hit. But if you flip the other to put the logging first, then you are observing more on the client behavior because all the requests will be logged. You might find that many of your functionality is already available as an interceptor in the wider gRPC ecosystem. Deadline and timeout, they are um, when the client is unwilling to wait for a response from the server, the client will receive a deadline exceeded status code from gRPC. This safeguards against RPC from taking infinite amount of time when it is doing um, the request, especially um, in the distributed systems where network latency or the servers can cost less. Deadline can be set from the client side when it starts an RPC, like in this step. Um, some languages have the concept of deadline, others use the idea of timeout. While deadline is that, it's a specific time point where your RPC cannot go pass by, but the uh, timeout is the max duration of the time to complete a RPC. These two concepts are interchangeable with each other. While deadline exceeded, it's very common when the request never leaves the client. For example, uh, in the typical scenario that the TCP connection cannot be established from the LB. But when it leaves the client, it will carry this um, deadline information to the server. It is possible that when server first receive the request, it already has unrealistically small amount of time to finish. At this time, it will just cancel the call and propagate deadline exceeded the status code to the client. Or in a distributed application, uh, it is typical, it's very possible that the server is also a client towards the downstream service. In this scenario, the um, propagating deadline from in incoming RPC to an ongoing or outgoing one is, uh, is supported by gRPC. There are many benefits of set, set, setting that line. For example, you optimize your resource usage, improve latency, and abort long-running um, operations that are unlikely to succeed. And it is the best practice to always set a deadline. While deadline triggers cancellation, a user can also actively terminate on outgoing on PC, uh, RPC actively. And this is done by do cancel on the client call object and sometimes on the context in some languages. Like in this code snippet, it cancels on a future step. The cancellation signal is uh, propagated to the server, and uh, normally um, gRPC does not have a mechanism to interrupt the server application of this cancellation, but that is not a problem. The server can check the cancellation status on the call. And actually, to optimize resource utilization, if RPC is long-lived, the server handler should periodically um, check the status of the call to see whether it is canceled and cease operation if it does, and propagate the operation downstreams. Um, by reattempting the failed operations, applications can overcome various problems, temporary issues like network or server glitches. Retry component stands in the core above the transport layer, and when retry happens, it will duplicate a stream on the transport. Users uh, does not immediately notice retry exists, except for increased latency. But with growing, the growing support for observability, you can see more information on retry, which is awesome. And let's dive more into the retry logics. So gRPC built-in retry logic will save the call history, and then if needed, it will replay the call on pot uh, when potential retry happens. To opt in, the user will specify retry policy in the service config. 
So retry policy um, includes, say, the maximum attempts, the back of policy, and retriable status code list. GRPC will monitor an um, RPC's event status, and if certain criteria are met, for example, the retry is uh, the RPC is within the maximum attempt and it's within the retriable status code. It will uh, duplicate a retriable stream on the transport upon the back off exponential exponential back off delays. Once the response header has been received, the RPC will hand over to the application and there will no, be no more retries. Even without explicit configuration, retry can also happen as a transparent retry. It can be multiple, uh, a limited time of transparent retry if the request never leaves the client, or a single one if it leaves the client but never seen by the server application. If we configure observability, um, say open telemetry, then you can see the retry information, for example, retry attempts, and the uh, retry latencies on as, uh, open telemetry metrics and tracing. When a server receives a response successfully, it can complete successfully. Um, but there, it also possible that it will um, be ended up in error. This is uh, due to like server errors, client cancellation as we talked, or the network errors. Normally, client kind of server will agree on the status of RPC. But it is also possible that, the, for example, the server uh, will see the, kind, the request being successful, while due to communication reasons, the client will see the error status in the client. But this is fine. It is important to shut down server and the channel to recollect resources. You will call shut down on the channel object that will cancel the new calls immediately, but will let um, the pre-existing calls to continue. Well, you can also do a, a forceful shutdown that will cancel the new and the both new and the pre-existing calls immediately. Shutdown is asynchronous. You can call um, a wait termination to wait for all the resources to be connected and then it will give up if certain timeout is reached. To summarize, today we talked about gRPC library structure components. We touched a bit on the name resolver and load balancer, and uh, we walked through the RPC lifecycle. We talked that our uh, application will send messages on the stub and the on the protobuf generator layer. And then asynchronously, name resolution will do um, uh, will do its work and then the load balancer will establish connection and pick a subchannel for the request. Well, the, initially the RPC will buffer for a while, but the next one it will be much faster. RPC turn into a retrieval stream at the transport and it might um, be canceled at any time if that line exceeded or if there is an explicit cancellation. And finally, hopefully the RPC and all the channel and the servers will be terminated properly. GRPC use cases are every, everywhere. It is especially powerful in building microservices thanks to the XDS offerings in the proxy-less service mesh solution. That wraps up my presentation. Thank you all for your time and attention. <laughs>